Okay, today we're uh, going to revisit another chat with a good friend, Gregory Taylor. My last chat with Gregory was one of my favorite, and so I was anxious to come back to this. But also I did want him to sort of fulfill some of his promises, talk about some of the areas that he didn't talk about. Um, but I, there were a couple of those, and so I'm going to let him sort of choose where we want to go. So Gregory, where Whoa. would you like to go? <clears throat> well... The thing about these podcasts is people listen to them uh, probably far away from the circumstances that they were made. But uh, maybe one of the things I wanted to start with for this one, and you'll, if you're listening to this two years from now, you'll have to look it up. Um, Darwin and I are having our chat very shortly after the death of Todd Dockstadter, who's uh, mm -hmm. a composer and electronic musician whose work has had a really powerful effect on a lot of us. Uh, and somebody who... Um, is really interesting in terms not only of the trajectory of his own work, but also in terms of uh, his relationship with kind of the larger structure of electronic music as a culture. And I think, I guess, um, Todd's life, thinking about Todd's life with his death, is uh, something, I guess maybe I felt like saying something about it. Your podcast with Justin Brearley was... Uh, <clears throat> well, it was really moving first because generally speaking, when we do podcasts about art and technology, we don't usually talk to people whose hearts are broken. Right. We right. don't talk about people in, in the midst of grief. And that was, I, I think, uh, it was a really poignant discussion. But instead of, you know, talking about the the poignancy of it, I guess the thing to say in terms of of coming away from that is the idea of thinking of the curve of someone's work as a life's activity. I mean, most of us who make things think about uh, what we're making. A lot of people who talk about this podcast, you know, we'll, we'll refer to history, but we talk about ourselves in the now. We don't really make very much reference to the fact that we've been around uh, for a while, although I guess I wound up doing that by virtue of being shocked at being on the air for over two decades. <laughs> <clears throat> but the, but Todd's passing reminded me of something that I guess I alluded a little bit to because it's at the center of something that I've been personally interested in for a long time. And that's the idea that um, your work has a sort of shape to it. And more than that, um, History matters. There's probably no other simpler way to say that. But Todd's death has really turned me toward thinking about that again. And so I guess uh, I'd sort of like to start first by saying uh, how profoundly influenced by his music I think almost all of us who do electronic music, certainly people on this podcast would certainly do that. Keith Fuller and Whitman a couple of weeks ago in one of your earlier podcasts spoke really movingly about who Todd was and why his work mattered to him right. as a kind of a, a really dedicated and focused person who was an outsider. Right. And one of the things that may not be clear, I think, to a lot of younger listeners is that one of the reasons that this is a great time to be alive, if you're doing electronic music, is that um, we are very slowly excavating and making public the work of people who were outsiders. You know, it's, it's a truism that, that history is often written by people who are victorious. And history is also something that's given to us and received. And there are people who are either uh, excised from history entirely because they were the vanquished, or people who sort of get written out because they weren't, you know, insiders or things like that. And as difficult as it is for us to think about, the practice of electronic music has its insiders and outsiders. And one of the great things about being alive now is that we have access to the work of people who were, uh, who were outsiders. And we have the option, we have the opportunity to to contemplate their work, to think about what they were doing, to see, in some cases, in the, in the case of people who have a long history of recording behind them, to see what it looks like to follow another path. And uh, Todd's work just has really made me think about this. First, I'm a, like everybody else, 
you know, I encountered um, his tape music, Quater Mass, that mm -hmm. stuff. It's right. and it just, I couldn't believe that it wasn't made by somebody who had access to all kinds of academic equipment because you know in those days electronic music with very few exceptions the dutch actually being one of them right. uh was made but was made at academic institutions that was where that work was done it was kind of like research and the idea that it was a guy with like a couple of tape recorders and a razor blade was just astounding especially when you listen to the work that this just fully formed passionate interesting cerebral work you think like how did this guy do it uh how did this guy do it alone and um there's also the sense in which you have the opportunity to investigate what that path looks like in somebody else's life and if you're somebody who um you know tries to think about what you think with and i think that's one of the things that that at least i do or I came to realizing or deciding was important, then it's a great honor to have that kind of work to go back through and, and, to, and, to, and to visualize. In Todd's case, and a lot of people talk about his earlier tape work, so I just want to stop and say a little bit about uh, the work that he produced right around uh, and released in the late 90s, turn of the century. We have this amazing body of Todd's tape work, but he has a sort of second career, and that is uh, starting around turn of the century, um, the uh, he put out a series of three recordings. They're all called Aerial, and they were um, electronic or computer music because he'd gone to using computers by then. Created uh, by collecting and modifying shortwave radio broadcasts. There are three discs worth of material. <clears throat> it's an absolutely astonishing piece of work. But yeah, I have, I have to say that, well, they have those on Spotify, and I have to say I've become obsessed with the Ariel series. Oh. It's amazing and, and, and somehow speaks to me in a way that so much of that kind of stuff doesn't. Well, the reason that it – everybody's vision will be different. The reason that it does it to me, and that I guess this is kind of – maybe this will be true for the rest of you um, – I never really spent a lot of time with a tape block and and working physically with tape. We had to do it a little bit when I was in when I was in school, but it was not really a part of my practice. But listening to that work was really moving and sobering because I think everybody who's gone anywhere near shortwave stations or FM mm -hmm. stations and mm -hmm. and tune between the stations has thought, God, this stuff is this is astounding. This is like. These are like accidental things that sound, you know, like so your John Cage right. button uh, bit floats high and gets stuck. <coughs> and you think, <laughs> and you think, man, I could make music out of this. Right. And then you sort of stop and you think, well, yeah, you know, I could do that. Um, so the question is, do I want to just like be a Cajun proceduralist, <laughs> turn on the radio, flip the dial for five minutes? Or do I really want to, like, listen to the shortwave radio, like, every night for two hours for the next little while and find the most divine things ever? Like, what great accidents are out there? Right. And a lot of you may have actually made pieces that way. But in my particular case, I sort of didn't because, for me, I thought, you know... I would really be that second guy. And I thought, yeah. oh, two hours of shortwave noise every night, man, that's going to take forever. <laughs> and listening it's going to hurt. It's going to oh, leave yeah. a mark. <laughs> and listening to Todd Doc's daughter's aerial work was astounding because here was a guy who had the same idea as I did, but he actually did the work. To yeah, listen to that work through. is, is right. to be <clears throat> uh, unseated and moved by the fact that here was a guy who really did spend the time. He spent hours doing it. He thought he had the same thoughts you did, but the way that he pursued it was not the way that I did. And it's, for me, one of the great things about history has to do with this idea that you can uh, look into, you know, you have all your friends working in the present, but history is great because you can look into the past and you can find people who are like, had the same ideas that you did in some way. Of course, they're not going to be exactly the same because times change. But, but sort of like standing on the bridge and like looking, looking at the direction of the rivers flowing, 
and there's somebody in a little boat out on the water, and you can just barely see him. He's like, it looks like a like an old Italian guy whose face is like all beard, and he's standing in the back of the boat, and and he's been dead for forty years, and he's like looks at you, looks up at you, and and kind of smiles like he knows you, and he sort of waves, and you think, oh, you know what? That would have been me. That guy would. So to me, that's why. That's what his. That's what history does. It's the possibility of, of discovering, like minds. Now, doing that by virtue of the work that people produce or what they write or have to say, is obviously really important to that. Which means, having access to that material really matters. So the great thing about being alive right now is there are tons of labels out there who are working very hard to make it possible for you to hear people who've been written out of history. Right. So if you're an American record uh, person, uh, the important record label has released a collection of, I don't know, 12, 13 CDs of Pauline Oliveris' early work. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you get to hear what it was she was doing in a really different way. Because it's pretty much, you know, it's not everything she did, obviously, but it's a body of work that, frankly, we never had a chance to hear. Uh, Important just did that with a reissue of some work from uh, a really nice and uh, very interesting Danish composer, uh, Elsie Marie Pada, whose work is absolutely astounding. Uh, she's largely unknown. The Di Schachtel label out of Italy has produced, uh, released work from Teresa Rampazzi, um, uh, in Scacci, Sachi, um, the work from the new, the NPS group, which basically is sort of like this, uh, well, they eventually became completely feminist performance ensemble. Amazing work. Elian Radig's work, for example, we have access to, mm -hmm. uh, Daphne Oram, Delia Derbyshire. Um, if you're Dutch, Tira de Meyer Zoyans, there, there are these really interesting people. And yeah, you know what? A whole bunch of them are women. Right, because women written. were written out of history in general. Well, yeah, absolutely, and you get to get you get to wonder, either you get to either see why you think they got written out of history, <laughs> uh, because they weren't doing the right kind of work, and I put the word right in quotes yeah, I, there. I hear you. Or because <clears throat> they didn't fit in with the institution that they were working in, uh, they started doing different kinds of work. So, for example, they started doing work that. Uh, in the late 50s and early 60s involved improvisation, which real composers, quote-unquote, hardly ever did for whatever reason. Right. They started doing work where they got interested in doing work with children. And let's face it, uh, Milton Babbitt didn't do a lot of he work. not going to hang out with children. No, right? no. So the great thing now is you get to hear all of that work. And you know what? We have astounding foremothers. Yeah, well, it's funny that you mentioned that because one of the th when I uh, did the interview with uh, Daria Semigan, mm -hmm. she talked about sort of the improvisational nature of her compositions and did so kind of in a way that almost seemed apologetic. And it's a really great point, which is that she came up through the ranks and was probably soundly beat around the head and shoulders for doing such a thing because what proved you were a, a composer was massive amounts of documentation of the notes that would be played yeah that's exactly right it it val it it tended to privilege a certain attitude toward composition now right. we should stop at this point and say as brutal and vicious as that is it's also true that it's very difficult to imagine the development of electronic music without the idea that at one point in time there were a whole bunch of composers who had this idea that um, specifying everything about a piece of music, being able to control and specify everything about it precisely, was the goal of composition. Right. Right? Because without that, there's a whole lot of stuff about the development of electronic music that we don't get. But... The history itself is actually why is actually kind of wider and cooler. I mean, you know, here's here's a kind of difference. When I was 
and when I was in my 20s, if you studied anything about electronic music, you learned, let me think, what did you, this is going to be a little bit clumsy, and if there are any people who teach the history of electronic music out there... They can come and yell at you, huh? That's exactly right. Please come and yell at me the next time we see each other. But my distinct memory of it is electronic music uh, in Europe happened in only two places. It happened in Paris, and it happened in uh, at Westdeutsche Radio in Cologne. And they were two wildly different groups of music because one of them was a whole bunch of Germans who basically were atonal serialists who attempted to specify uh, all musical behavior moving from Herbert Eimert on forward and uh, culminating in algorithmic comp compositional projects like uh, Gottfried Michael Koenig's Project One. And then there were the French who were doing things with like turntables and thinking of recordings of things as concrete objects that could be manipulated. Mm -hmm. And... And, oh, yeah, there were a couple of Americans who horsed around with tape music, and then there were Americans who decided they wanted to do that kind of specification, so the Columbia Princeton Electronic Music Center happened. Then there were a bunch of hippies in San Francisco. So that history is kind of gives you the idea that it's only it only happens in a very few places, and it only happens with a very few people. It turns out that history is is unnecessarily reductive. There are uh, one thing about them that is true, however, and you run into this once you start listening more broadly, is that in the early days, you were working with equipment that was really expensive. Right. And the only way to be able to afford it in almost every case was to have a, cent a center not only of what we would now think of as cultural capital, uh, but also uh, intellectual capital. So you could <coughs> you could have you know, technicians and guys who actually owned and bought tape machines. Right. Now, before we before we go on, I, I do want to talk a little bit about this reductive nature of history because I couldn't agree with you more. I <laughs> literally, just before um, I got on the horn with you, um, I was watching on Netflix, I was watching the Greenwich Village uh, documentary. And the Greenwich Village documentary pretty much makes it clear that from this person's perspective, um, folk music was born and uh, matured and, uh, and came to being as a result of the environment in Greenwich Village. And, uh, you know, being a, being a kid <coughs> from the lumber towns of the Great White North, I feel definitely like that's, you know, crazy. That's crazy. It's crazy, right? But in in this date, it, it seems like what's what's happening right now. We've gone from history being defined by the academic history books for whatever area you're into, to now being um, the history is defined by whatever a documentarian <laughs> decides to make a movie about, right? Yeah, well, it's a slightly and better. It's a slightly better system. I mean, having well, lots of documentary de filmmakers, document, uh, a little is, more democratic, maybe. But yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a little bit more like having the new music distribution service for electronic and experimental music in the late 1970s. It's kind of like, yeah, they're kind of a little bit weird and off the wall and singular in their own way. But at least, at least it's not. <laughs> it's least it's not. You know, all we have is Columbia Records, right? No, right. which is which, by the way, was a great source for experimental music because they hired David Behrman in the late sixties for reasons I don't understand. <laughs> That's why we have Harry Parch. It's how we got uh, Terry Riley. It's how we got yeah. That's why that stuff happened. So even big companies sometimes by accident do cool right. stuff. But so anyway, I just did want to kind of throw that point out there because you know what I'm hoping for is like the the documentary of um like the the little electronic music scene out of Ida or Iowa City for example yeah that would be that would be totally well, so, okay so I'll tell you about one I'll tell you about one story that I sort of know and I sort of know it because uh <clears throat> I was lucky enough to live in the Netherlands I have a terrible reading knowledge of Dutch my spoken Dutch is even worse but I can follow it so um, here's an interesting history, and uh, the good news about the history is, um, it's is it okay if I uh, say something about a book? Yeah, so, uh, you can okay. even, you can even curse. So 
<laughs> oh, okay. Well, I generally, I generally don't. Okay. So for those of you who are listening to this and thinking uh, this might, this discussion might not be a waste of my time, I have a book for you to read. The book is written by a guy named Case Tazelaar, T-A-Z-E-L-A-A-R. Yes, that's right. He's Dutch. The book is called On the Threshold of Beauty, colon, Phillips and the Origins of Electronic Music in the Netherlands, 1925 to 1965. It's a fantastic book. There are a couple of reasons you might want to read the book. If uh, you're at all interested in the Phillips booth at the World's Fair in Brussels right. and the piece of music that Edgar Varese wrote for it, uh, then you absolutely should read that book because a discussion about how that thing came into being and how it was – the technical details of its doing, it's all in there. But it's an awesome story because Case also tells you the story about – the fights that were behind it and stuff like that. So, uh, for example, did you know that the, I believe the first person they approached about making music for the, uh, for the Phillips pavilion was Benjamin Britten. Really? Yes. That's yeah. I think it's Benjamin Britten. Anyway, somebody you would never expect. Uh, the idea being that, yeah, the young person's guide to the orchestra, I think it was Britten, but anyway, um, they approached somebody else, and when they got to Varese, he said, yeah, I'll do it, but only under a certain, a couple of, oh, Le Corbusier designed the building, and Corbusier said, okay, I'll do it, but if I build this building for you, uh, I want you to use Edgar Varese as the composer to do the music in this building, and the Dutch were like, who is this guy, we don't know anything <laughs> about him, is he a real composer, and there's this whole negotiation about, like, oh, do we really want to do this, and right. then... They listened to his music, and some of them came back and said, oh, this is too weird. People are going to really hate this. What are we going to do? So there's this whole negotiation. And Tazlar actually has the whole story in there. And it's absolutely fascinating. Because when we think of the music for the, for the Phillips Pavilion in Brussels, we think of it as like a really revolutionary event fixed thing. And we don't think of it as a whole bunch of people fighting about stuff. Right, right. And that story is in there, including, and here's the great thing, they were so concerned that it wasn't going to work out that they had a second person standing by. Oh, the backup plan? Yeah, there plan was a B. backup. There was a backup guy who was going to do the stuff. Oh, my God. And, like, literally almost up to the last minute. It's an astounding story. That's amazing because there, again, you know, so you would you would catch some of the the public view of this story like in that book, the rest is noise, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yep. And you get uh, you get a sense of really smart people made a wonderful decision that just worked out fabulously. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> right. The real story. <laughs> the real is story is even cooler. <laughs> the other thing that Case does that I think is just absolutely godlike is he spends a lot of time talking about the technical challenges of doing it. I mean, you hear that piece of music, and Case actually tells you how it's done and how and what kinds of technical solutions had to be the, the people had to come up with to do it right at Phillips because they had to, it, it. It was not only a new piece, but it was basically a completely different way of presenting stuff. There are these discussions about like what the visual material that would go with it. With okay, so that's one great reason to read the other to read the book. The other reason to read the book is that Case has done something that if you study in the Netherlands, you kind of know this. Uh, if you have a really good electronic music teacher, you kind of know this, uh, but most people don't. And that is there's something really interesting about electronic music practice in the Netherlands. And here's what it is. If you buy the narrative that electronic music in Europe happens in two places, only two places, this is the clumsy reductionist version. Mm -hmm. Even if you buy that idea, there's something that probably hasn't occurred to you. And that is, who made the gear right. that people use to make the pieces? And the short answer is, uh, quite often, it's Philips, right. the Dutch electronics firm. Philips, as a company, actually had a bunch of people that worked on building equipment for early practitioners of electronic tape music. And more than that, uh, Philips was a company. I don't know if they still do this, but they were. They kind of. They kind of did it. But 
Um, Phillips tended to hire engineers very young. Uh, they, they had feeder schools like the Technical University at Delft, and very often like good engineers would be hired from Delft straight to Phillips. They'd work for Phillips their entire lives on various projects. And Phillips was a you know a pretty big company. Mm -hmm. So that so there was this idea at some point where people at Phillips decide to say, you know, this electronic technology stuff, um, there's some real product opportunities here. We should be thinking about doing this. And so they set up these like little skunk works projects that would do things like um, the diffusion of uh, recorded performance. So like instead of thinking about like just a single speaker, what about multiple speaker arrays and how could we make new? So they were actually working on this really interesting stuff when electronic tape music showed up. Now, it didn't come out of the blue, but it sort of showed up, and they wound up building the gear. Not just that, but the people who built the gear would often be kind of, um, they were skunk works guys. They weren't, you know, it's, it's wrong to say they were pariahs within the firm. But, but the, the working group tended to attract um, certain kinds of people who did interesting stuff. And in many cases, those engineers were assigned to work as assistants for other composers or to create stuff to be installed in these the, the big, quote-unquote, electronic music centers. Well, it turns out, if you look at some of the early composers of electronic tape music in the Netherlands, you do, in fact, find composers who are part of that whole Germanic, let's specify everything stuff. But the interesting thing about it is some of them are technology or technicians from Phillips. Oh, They're the guys who build the gear and they start horsing around with the gear and saying, well, you know, you could actually, I you could do this, right. Yeah. And the other thing that, that some of them do, it's not very many of them, but there are two guys in particular, uh, Jan Boerman and a guy named Dick Reimachers, who's probably better known than Jan Boerman, who pretty much um, get enough gear <coughs> to uh, set up their own private studios. Oh, so uh, one of the really famous ones is Jan Boerman and Dick Reimachers, who build their own little studio in in the city of Utrecht, which is sort of like you can walk by it today. I think I don't even know who lives in it, but it's you know everybody knows where it is. Mm -hmm. And the idea is they had their own studio. So in, so if you wanted like to like the beginning at, of the project studio movement, exactly. If you wanted to work <laughs> at West Deutsche Radio in Germany, or if you wanted to work in in Paris, you had to be a certain kind of composer. Right. They let students in who maybe weren't that kind of composer and let them horse around with the material, but to really do the work. Whereas these Dutch guys, like Jan Boerman is a really interesting guy. He had his own studio for years and years and years. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the Dutch label Near has a, a box set of all of his words, like, I don't know, 10 CDs. And what you get to hear when you do that is what you get to do when you have the studio space entirely to yourself. There's no pressure there's nobody sitting around telling you what you're supposed to do. What do you do? How do you? How does that change the craft that you have? That's one of the other things that Tazalar gets to talk about. So I would have said, if we'd had this conversation five or ten years ago, I would have said, you know, there's a lot of really cool, interesting ideas about electronic music practice in the Netherlands that's sort of like every Dutch person who does that kind of knows about, and for some reason they don't bother to tell other people. <laughs> and it remains an interesting secret. Right. And in my case, it uh, really is. Like, until I was in school, I suddenly realized that, like, everybody in my class knew stuff I didn't know. And that's what they knew. And well, I, would, I would just, like, come back to the United States and say, you guys, you guys, you won't believe it. There, there are these, like, Dutch composers who were, like, uh, technicians who built gear for other people and then decided to make their own stuff. Isn't that awesome? And everybody would say, what? <laughs> Except, and you'd go back to my Dutch friends and I'd say, why don't you tell people about this? Right. This is an astounding story. It explains so much stuff about how, uh, how some of this went. Yeah. yeah. Well, let us all raise our foaming glass of beverage and, and praise Case Tazlar for actually writing this stuff down. I think there's another book to be written to be written for the period after uh, after 1965 because, of course, there's political upheaval and uh, time happens when a big piece of art is funded. And well, anyway, that's a, that's another story. That's another story for another exactly. podcast. But now. When you talk about uh, going to school and learning this stuff and then coming back to the U.S., is this when you were at Synology? 
Yeah, it was. It was. Okay. My wife got a. My wife received a Fulbright, um, and <clears throat> we pretty much wound up moving to the city of Utrecht to, uh, it, because that's where she was going to do her work. Uh, and since I'm an idiot, I thought uh, the Institute for Sinology is in the city of Utrecht. This will be awesome. I can go visit. Maybe I can even go there or something like that. Well, of course. Uh, what I didn't realize is in, in the late 1980s, 86 or 87, they'd actually moved from the city of Utrecht to The Hague. Oh, okay. My memory of it is that the program got traded to the Royal Conservatory in uh, the quid pro quo was for it was something like Baroque performance or a, swap, a draft a swap choice program. to be named later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, it, it sounds like the the draft, but that's how they that's how they right, do right. curriculum in those days. That's interesting. Um, well, so they're um, in the Hague. So they're in the Hague. So it. I think I'm going to the Netherlands. I'll let's see if I can get in. So I uh, so we're, while we're on a visit, I I call up a guy who turned out to be one of my teachers later, Paul Baird. Who said, "Well, I live in Utrecht. We can get together and uh, and have some coffee or a drink and talk a little bit." And I thought, "This will be great. I get to talk to a famous sonologist because, of course, <laughs> I knew his work as an algorithmic composer. He's he's one of the men. He's one of the guys." And I thought, right, right. "This will be great. I can read this famous guy." I didn't realize he was American. You know, I didn't know any of this right, stuff. Right. So I have a drink with him, and I went into it thinking, <clears throat> "This is either going to be the best thing or it'll be the worst thing in my life." Because I thought, well, if I do want to do anything at Synology, like, what if I go in and they, like, reach up. into the piano bench and pull out uh, a Chopin etude and put it on the key, put it on the music stand right. upside down and say, uh, sight read this and transpose it a minor third. Right. If they do that, I'm boned. It's right. over. Right. But instead, he was great. He was cordial. He was really interesting. We spent a lot of time talking about Indonesian music, which... I've loved and studied for a long time, and he sort of thought, "Yeah, this yeah, it would be really neat to have somebody in the program who knows what you know." And I thought, "Well, this is great, so I'll go." So I had the choice at the time of involve of like enrolling in a you know a language program and, and actually learning to speak Dutch really well, or going to Synology. And while I've occasionally felt like, well, maybe if I'd learned Dutch better earlier on, I'd be a lot better at Dutch now because I suck at it. Uh, but instead, going to Synology just uh, changed my life. And so so we went, um, I went in. I'm, I'm curious, you, for those of you who are listening who don't know, don't know Gregory uh, personally, Gregory is a big fan of kind of all things Dutch. Um, were you a big... Well, my wife is Dutch. Well, that helps, doesn't it? I, I married it. I married into the culture. You married into it. So, um, but my question is: Were you, were you into it prior to going over there, or was that's that good, something that no, that's developed while question. you were there? No, a lot of it had to do. A lot of it had to do with Yolanda. But um, one of the things about uh, one of the things about my interest at the time in electronic music was that that if you did anything, other, if you knew about anything other than uh, programs like <coughs> uh, West Social Radio or the, the GRM guys in Paris, then you knew about a couple of other outlier places. And one of the places that you absolutely knew about was the Institute of Sonology. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason for that was that um, they were really uh, instrumental in a couple of shifts in electronic music practice um, in, the 19, uh, in the 1970s and 1980s. So one of the things that they were really very well known for at the time was algorithmic composition. They were they they really kept a real focus on that kind of stuff. And a number of their students came to the United States, which is of course the way that we know about it. So people like uh, Court Lippi, uh, Robert Rowe, Barry Truax. There you know there are a number of composers who were educated there who brought those interests back. And okay. so if you all right, that's interesting to me because you're helping me connect some dots. Because one of the problems is you say you know. Things like, and this is how we know about Synology today, but I have to admit that Synology has done a very good job of hiding its light under a bushel, <laughs> right? And that's partially, that maybe because they're Dutch. Basically, well, maybe, maybe it is, but I mean, so can you give us a little history about where they even come from? Yeah, but sure. But to hear that people like Robert Rohr are coming to the U.S. out of that program, yep. I didn't realize that. That's stunning. 
Well, there's a lot of stuff about, uh, particularly about algorithmic practice, and also some of the early experiments in the PDP-11 are all Synology stuff. So basically, um, there's a studio for electronic music at the Philips Research Laboratories in the city of Eindhoven, which is sort of, in those days, was kind of a factory town for Philips. Okay. And then, starting in the 1960s, um, there was a studio founded at the University of Utrecht, so right around the turn of the 60s, um, that was called the Studio for Electronic Music, which I think was <coughs> STEM or something. It had an algorithm anyway. Um, and in and that was essentially run by a pretty well-known composer at the time, German guy, Gottfried Michael Koenig, who did a lot of work on algorithmic composition. Those of you who read electronic music history will probably recognize uh, his uh, function pieces. They're all color functions, so like... Funktion Blau or stuff. There's a bunch of those pieces, um, and he also invented a program a program to do twelve tone serialization called Project One. That's really famous. Oh, yes. So uh, that that th that old studio turned into the Institute of Sonology, um, and a number of people who were working there at the time were really instrumental in the switch from analog to digitally specified music. Now, again, that was one of those things that required money because you had to be able to buy things like a PDP-15, uh, which is a very old kind of computer, which has half the memory of your laptop right. on it. So let, oh, we'll avoid the... What was the, the size oh, of your basement? Yeah, exactly. Well, a very, very large ice box. Right. Um, and so in those days, we have uh, a lot of people who basically turn to using uh, digital computers to do compositional algorithms. And that's where we get... Um, uh, not just algorithms, but also the sound of work as well. So uh, for those of you who know what VoSim is, it's a way of, of simulating vocal track stuff, that work uh, is done at the Institute of Sonology by Werner Kage. Um, there's a bunch of work with uh, some of the early work with uh, granular synthesis and sort of thinking of granular synthesis as a way to organize musical behavior, not just sound, but compositions itself. That shows up at the time. Uh, Barry Truax is there with uh, what he called at the time his pod system. Uh, Paul Berg wrote a system that did uh, algorithmic stuff called Pile. Um, and then in the late, so that sort of continues. So Synology is really interesting to me at the time as a student because it had not only, uh, you know, not only could you, could you, work on things like Atari systems, do digital stuff, but it also had and still has one of the most kick-ass analog tape studios in the universe full stop. Mm. It's really, it, it's really, really beautiful. Johann von Krey still uh, keeps it up as a, uh, a loving thing. The last time I was in the Netherlands, I went to visit him and uh, at, I don't want to say my eyes, eyes filled with tears when I walked back into that room, but it's just an absolutely ex exquisite analog studio. And in some respects, it ruined me up until the return of the boutique analog. It ruined me because it was so astoundingly well done. Right. Uh, so anyway, that went to the Royal Conservatory at The Hague. And, you know, currently, I guess they... Um, they have a number of projects ongoing, but they're still, I think, really, really well known for things like uh, algorithmic composition. They were also really involved early on on the idea of live electronic music. Mm -hmm. And with uh, Case Tazelar uh, taking over the program, they're also uh, kind of really interested in uh, reconstructions of electronic and computer music as well, because Case has a real, uh, has a real, I guess we would say, burden on his heart for the history of the field. So he's also responsible for bringing us uh, the Tom Disavelt, Dick and Eimacher stuff, uh, music from outer space, making, right. you know, bringing that stuff back to us because he was really, uh, he's really involved in that. And uh, so there's like, there's like the standard one year Synology course. They have bachelor's and master's. And Synology is interesting because it's one of those things that people went to and studied and very often would return back to the United States and bring the gospel of algorithmic comp uh, composition back with them. And, you know, Synology, like a lot of European schools, was kind of, you know, into the European high modernism thing. But um, I think 
they were kind of interesting to me also because their high modernism was also covered pretty strongly by uh, the social revolutions of the 60s and early 70s as well. So it wasn't just that. You'd have uh, composers whose work was informed by uh, was informed by all kinds of politics. Conrad Berrimer being, of course, one of the big guys like that. Dick and Eimacher, same thing. And they were really, you know, so when you went to Synology, so, I, you know, I just, I'll think about my coursework. When you went to Synology, you learned digital signal processing with Stan Templars. Uh, you spent time learning uh, fourth with Joel Ryan. Uh, you learned, uh, you learned Lisp from Paul Berg. You spent time in the analog studio, but you also read Pierre Boulez. You read Jacques Attali's uh, work, Noise. Um, if you were lucky enough to have a little Dutch, you took lessons with Dick Reimachers, which was probably one of the luckiest things that ever happened to me while I was there. Um, and it was a really unusual program in that it combined you know, digital, analog, live performance, algorithmic stuff, and uh, some really uh, informed theoretical theoretical stuff. It's a great, it was a great program. Well, but it also sounds, what's, what's interesting is going back to what you were talking about earlier, it also seems to a place, to be a place that actually valued history rather than being in a rush to chuck it out the window. Well, I suppose it's possible that uh, you know, the thing to remember about this is I'm older than the average student at the time. So for all I know, they didn't they oh, didn't, they care. didn't care. You know, they didn't care a bit. It could okay. be. Now, the people that have since become my close friends did. I mean, their engagement was, you know, that they had like a great tape library. So, uh, you know, like three days a week, I would spend my lunchtime. I would have my little half cheese sandwich and I would like kill that off in three minutes. And then I'd go upstairs and I would listen to everything I could get my hands on, including like crap loads of radio performances and live stuff that was never, ever released. And it was just all there. You just go in and show me a little student card and that would be, you'd spend an hour with that. So for me, that's when, uh, that's when I listened to everything I could get my hands on. Do, do I, did everybody else do that? I have no idea. Do I know that some of my uh, classmates who have since become my friends, Justin Bennett, uh, Rolf Tolkien-Payas, do I know those guys did it? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Because they were rushing through their cheese sandwich as well. Uh, well, probably. Or they were, in the li- they were in the library at different times. Right. Because they, you know. But there were, people that cle- there were people that clearly did it. And again, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, there is a real sense in which I would occasionally be sitting in my, you know, sitting at my, uh, in my little desk taking notes and thinking like, you know, this is the guy that implemented Vosim stuff. This right. is Stan Temp. This is not just like my teacher. This is like Stan Templars. This is like a, an, a, an embodiment. Boy, this sounds daffy. Sorry about this. He's an embodiment of wisdom. Sure. Oh, because if you, you know, right. if you, if you grow up somewhere else, your idea is like, Art is mediated to you by objects. Uh, things in books are facts in books. And you just don't always think about the idea that those are the products of people. Right. And, you know, that's – so to me, the thing about uh, – the thing, the thing about Justin Burley's thing about Todd Dockstadter was I felt like I knew something about him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was – As a person. A, right. guy, a person, a man who instantiated, like, all of this stuff. And – the fact of the matter is, he doesn't merely reduce to his ideas. That's the other thing. He's a person. Right. And for me, being in Synology was like, you know, I knew who Paul Berg was, but I didn't, I would just sit in that class and I would think, this is Paul Berg. This is Stan Templars. This is like Joel Ryan, that guy that did that impossibly cool number readers piece with the Hall effect sensors on his fingers. Holy Moses. It And... Uh, and now, of course, uh, I think about Dick Reimachers that way. Right. And, because, in fact, when I was sitting in Dick's class, I was like, do I really know what that word means in Dutch? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I was running as hard as I could linguistically to keep up. Just but, to keep up, right. But I, you know, I I studied with those guys. So that's that, that helps me a lot understand more about what the environment was. Because, again, uh, they have done a good job of hiding what they do and their influence on the well, world. Well, they're going, they're going about their work. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's right, the deal. Right. It's, there are people marketing. who are, 
yeah, there are people who are like endlessly self-promoting, and then there are people who like just sit down, buckle down, and do and do the hard work. And frankly, we live in a culture that doesn't value. Well, just ask any woman. We live in a culture that doesn't value enablers. Right. You know, we value we value people that make stuff and talk really loudly about it, other than people who like do the hard work and the heavy lifting. And Synology, my experience in Synology might be really different than other people's, but my experience there was that there was a fantastic bunch of people and really complicated people who are available to you who would take you seriously. Mm -hmm. Now, you had, you know, they weren't going to sort of give you everything. You had to actually show interest and work hard and, frankly, put up with having them argue with you and stuff like that. But if you were willing to do that, there was... Uh, it was an astounding experience. And I'm sure there are other great programs throughout the world. So those of you who are, any of those of you may be educators, um, I'm sure you're doing a great job. And I'll bet that at some point in the future, there will be somebody on a podcast somewhere who talks to, you, uh, to about you like I'm talking about them. But I, I, owe those, uh, I owe those people a debt I can never repay. Right. I really do. Yeah. Um, so... Kind of coming back around uh, to to some of the discussion we were having about about Todd's work, how do how do outsiders fit in? So I mean, nominally the Dutch electronic music world was outsider, but it was still a whole lot more insider than a lot of other people doing a lot of other kinds of work. Now we've seen places where outsider work has gotten recognition i would think primarily of the west coast people absolutely um who were definitely outsiders but ended up finding their place in history some sure. because what they did was documented and some because of their influence on what became popular culture that's very true well the san francisco tape music center is not an academic enterprise right in that sense so there are places there are or were a place or the harvest works people in new york back in the early days same thing not an academic enterprise so there were local initiatives that did that did that kind of work right uh, todd's thing was um, a man who was a, a man with the chops and by virtue of his work at gotham recording studios was able to acquire the uh the necessary skills and have access to the equipment to do the work that he needed to do and and in in his case given uh how creative and self-directive he was he was able to realize astounding work that way uh, most of us probably have to work uh inside systems Right. Now that's in, that's far less that's far less true now, right? But Definitely. you know, and those systems when we talk about that period in the '60s, those systems are not all Western systems. Yeah, I, mean, I was just going to ask where are some other places, particularly places that are off the beaten path, meaning the beaten path <coughs> of people who fly between New York and Frankfurt and yeah. then take a one-hour train ride, right? But well, in, the um, case of, in the case of intermedia work, some of those are going to be are going to be accidents, uh, accidents of propinquity, closeness. So, for example, if we think about uh, if we think about a place like um, Wesleyan University is a really good example. A relatively small liberal arts college um, has some really has produced some really interesting performers and work. Um, first, because they had interesting, intelligent people working there, but in, but also because. There's a center for world music, and there's also a bunch of electronic musicians. So the possibility that they might randomly collide um, would be it was high. It was high, and those and and also here's the other thing to say about it: they might randomly collide with people who did not view their particular practice as insular. Right. right. So. There are there are great world music teachers who feel that it's their primary responsibility to mediate um, the whole of a cultural practice, and in situations when you feel like your responsibility is to protect its history, however you understand that term, the the business of working between the lines becomes a little bit complicated. That's not true of everyone, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, for example. Um, you know, Lamont Young and Terry Riley heard a bunch of Indian stuff, 
and they convince Pan, uh, Pranath to come to live with them and study with them as a teacher. It's really difficult to fully assess the extent to which uh, that changed the, co the course of uh, American avant-garde work. Because clearly it's not just limited to uh, Lamont Young and Terry Riley, two right. of his better known students. Right. There are a number of others. Uh, uh, Christopher Hennix, for example, who did some, uh, has done doing and has done some great work. There's a lot of people who did that. But there's this sort of notion where one of the outsider sources is various kinds of non Western music. Steve Reich went to study uh, Ghanaian drumming and wound up, uh, you know, sort of taking what is a kind of communal practice business of drumming and to basically isolate certain kinds of of phase-based patterns and basically apply them to someplace else uh, in the case of pranath this idea of like indian music in the case of indonesian stuff the idea that indonesian music by its form and structure is essentially cyclical that there's this idea that you have uh, an underlying structure which is then uh elaborate it at different time scales over the top of it and the sort of resulting heterophonic stuff is the piece. The case of Japanese work we have this or, or the work of Korea certainly as well or China. We have uh, traditions where sort of timbre works different or the focus is on different kinds of physical practice. Mm -hmm. You know those things all have also fed I think, various forms of electronic music practice. And you can certainly find composers in all of those areas. The question is, how did they pick up what they needed? You know, because, sure, there the world's full of people who say, like, my work is based on uh, the uh, wedding music in uh, Azerbaijan. Well, it's well the world's of, not actually full of those people. Yeah, well, there's going to be people who do that. Right. And and the fact of the matter is they listened to an Azerbaijani record once and then went off and decided they knew what the thing was. Thing, right. But the truth is there are other people who sort of work between those cultural traditions and try and, and whose primary anxiety isn't that they're working in the cultural tradition, but they are trying to be both properly faithful and to still do work that's that's their own. And in some respects, one of the great gifts from non-Western music as an outsider discourse is it's given us different ways to think about structuring music. Um, let, me th let me think of sort of, oh, okay, this is as non-nerdy as I can be about it, and I will sing the praises of Indian music for a minute. <laughs> Indian music is uh, not... Ma is not a single discourse. There's Carnatic stuff. There's Hindustani stuff. The work that which vary. Uh, their practitioners would say that they vary really widely, but they have something in common that I've always been a little puzzled as to why electronic musicians don't pay more attention to. And it, it works like this. Um, one of the things that's complicated about Indian music is the idea of a rag because it's. It's a little difficult to nail down, and the simple thing that will probably have people throwing ripe fruit at me would be to say something like this. If you think of, in Western music, what you think of as a mode on one end of a line, and you think a tune on the other end, then the rag lives along that line. It's not a mode. It's not just a tune. It's this other thing that lives between those. Okay. So that's, that's the hard part. But here's the cool part. A raga always explains itself to anybody who's willing to listen. And its structure works like this. There's a sort of an opening structure. It'll have slightly different names. But the basic idea for a piece goes something like this. You start and you take the rag as the beginning point. And you take a section and there's no particular time associated with it. And during that section, you lay out the contours and the way the scale is used, and you sort of give people an idea of what the sonic world of the piece is like. And then you introduce a time pulse to it, whatever uh, tala you're in. And they, that will develop in very different ways. But basically the idea is you sketch out the melodic raw material, and then you bring the rhythm in, and then you elaborate on that, and then everybody gets to show off what they can do. 
right? That's and then basically you re you sort of like re you kind of like restate it again, and that's it. That's the whole thing. Okay. So technically speaking, you can sort of make sense of the piece by listening through it. Right. I suppose you could say that the sonata form is superior, blah, 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 because it has the same stuff. For some reason, that it probably has something to do with my particular deficits. I never understood or heard sonatas, or fugues for that matter, as that. I thought they were impossibly cool, but they didn't tell me everything I needed to know about the piece while I listened to them. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think Indonesian music for me totally did. And so when the time comes to think about structuring stuff, that's that's what Indian music taught me. Right. Now, I mean, obviously, right. I've never really studied it, but uh, with a teacher, because of course, in that tradition, your teacher really matters. Right. right, right? Because there are things about the raga that you won't get, you won't find out. And all you have to do to, to hear that is to listen to two different people do the same raga. It's really clear that something different is at work. And part of that difference at work has to do with virtuosity, but also who your teacher is. Sure. And some traditions, there uh, there are things that only your teacher will tell you. So uh, one of the instruments in Chinese music I really like is called a kuchin. Uh, it's spelled G-U-Q-I-N. It's a zither, fretless zither. Uh, which is really quiet, played often as a solo instrument. And if you decide to study it, as I decided I was going to do, um, it's really a good idea to find a teacher. And I thought, well, I can't find a teacher, so I'll just read a lot about it. So here's what I found out. The stuff is notated. It's notated out the kazoo. In fact, the, uh, the notation tells you things about what your left and your right hand are supposed to be doing that are way more specified than anything that i know of in western music okay so so you know they're like n kinds of vibrato and the notation tells you what vibrato you're supposed to use or you're supposed to start with this vibrato and switch to the other one and by the way the two fingers of your right hand should be bent back when you do this (laughs) it's just like insanely specified there's only one problem there's no indication as to time nothing it's just notes it's notes and what you do with your fingers. And if you're a Western person, you think, that's insane. What? Because if you have a really if you have the if you have a really old piece, uh, good luck trying to figure out right. how it works. Right. There are gonna be some physical things about it that will say, I couldn't possibly do this very fast, so I guess it must have been slower. But the point is, it's your teacher who who gives you that information. So when you study, that's what you acquire. Oh wow. So yeah, and and, you know, Pranath, what you learn when you study with Pranath is not the way to play the piano. It What you learn is what Pranath plays. Right. Yep. So that's, to me, one of the other sort of interesting things. And for electronic music, that becomes complicated because for so many of us, it's, it's an entirely it's an entirely separate uh, undertaking. But actually, those things have their roots in these, like, social groups. Ghanaian drumming takes a whole bunch of people to do. And, you know, clapping music is like only two people doing what uh, Ghanaian drummers do. Or listen to, to people like big drum ensembles like Dudu and Daya Rose, for example. You're, it's just difficult to sort of get that down to the idea of a phase pattern. That was Reich's genius. Mm-hmm. You, know, you could really do that. Right. Indian music, same thing. Lamont Young, the well-tuned piano is, is an interesting case of of like exploring a non-Western tuning thing that I can imagine. Terry Riley's keyboard works. It's hard to imagine those things without knowing the raga because it's really about what he does. I without think, without trying to to like mock it, you know. Oh no, or, not at all. In or, fact, my experience or, has been they really respect that tradition. Yeah, yeah. They're simply not bound by it. Or maybe mock wasn't the right word. Maybe like appropriate would be. Yeah, the yeah. Word. You know, well, not appropriation to sounds a little. That sounds a little. It sounds evil. Imperialist. <laughs> yeah, but the idea, no. But the idea is like, what part of a thing? You know, I lo- I love. I love Miles Davis, but I don't love everything Miles Davis does. I'm obviously not going to be like. Uh, uh, those guys that recorded kind of blue note for note over again. I'm not going to do that. So if I love Miles Davis, what part of what part of him, of of his work, do I take into myself? Like what what is it that I that I borrow? John Cage, same thing. When we think about 
if we're willing to admit that we have foremothers and forefathers, then how do we how do we talk about them? How do we respect them? And what do we try to communicate of our understanding of them to other people? Right. Because yeah, you know, the world's full of people who want disciples but no ancestors. I'm not really <laughs> one of those. I'm not really one of those guys. And I think my twenties would have been a lot easier if I'd had a better sense of who my ancestors were. It would have saved me a lot of trouble. Yeah. I, so now. How how do people honor history now? I mean, one of the things, and when we talked to when I talked to Mike Metley a couple of couple of weeks ago, he had he kind of went off on uh, this idea of the internet isn't an unvarnished positive because there's no clear gatekeepers. Um, it seems <coughs> like what he you know one of the things he was talking about was the the development of history and the development of the important people you need to be aware of in order to honor that history. Well, one of the ways, one of the ways that I think you honor history, and I think you're actually doing it. I mean, I'm, I'm going to take a moment and say nice things about you. Oh, one yeah. of the ways, one of the ways that you honor history is by the realization that history is not something that is made in the past. History is being made in the present moment. History is essentially the emergent uh, is the emergent dialogue that comes out of people who mark where they are in the present. So I think one of the great ways that we that we honor the idea of history, besides seeking to understand it, its people and its context and all that other stuff, which is hard work and takes time away from you sort of messing around with your analog rigs. So mm -hmm. let's not kid ourselves about that. It is a choice. It is an investment of time. But one of the ways that I think we honor history is by seeing ourselves as a part of it. And that's one of the things that I think I think you're giving, in some respects, this weekly podcast is a snapshot of history. And I would also say it is not a history that is made by great men. It's a history that's made by people who are doing all kinds of stuff and uh, one of the smart things that I think you've done. Or one of the things I think is really interesting, and you and I didn't do it here because this is our second chat, is this idea about people have to explain how they got where they got. Right. You right. know what I mean? That's... Well, because I'm fascinated by it because if not for no other reason, for my own track to where I'm at is such a convoluted hellhole, it's impossible <laughs> to have ever pre-imagined that that was the route to take, Right. Right. And um, what I'm finding is, you know, so for ages I thought, well, I had to take the hard road if I would have only followed the easy road that everyone else took. And in talking to people, I find out that nobody took an easy road because there was no such thing. Yeah. Well, every, everybody thinks, yeah, everyone thinks that their suffering is particular. Or, <laughs> or, there, are th <laughs> or there, are things, there are things about the... There are things about our forced to develop something in splendid isolation that actually may have turned out to be an advantage. Right. That might have actually been those accidents may have been the things that make that made us or make us because again, I'm I've spent a lot of time today talking about the past, but there are things that make us what we are. Yeah. One of the things about Case's book that I think is great uh -huh. uh, is that it's basically about the social history of things. Right. Another fantastic book about that is George Lewis's History of the Association for the Advancement of Creative Music, University of Chicago Press. The book is called A Power Stronger Than Itself, and it is essentially how the AACM came to be. Right. And it's a great book because it's full of those ideas about, you know, history is made by people in their own present, and here are their stories. Mm -hmm. Great book. Interesting. Yeah. Well, Gregory, I want to thank you for another fascinating <laughs> chat. It was uh, hilarious. I learned an awful lot. I really appreciate it. I just and, um, I, I, just feel like I sounded like I was a billion years old. Well, I know, but, you know, the flip side of it is um, one of the things, and, and you and I sometimes uh, in our business life chat about how um, – we see an awful lot of academic movement occurring within a very specific line of ancestry, right? Oh, yeah, true. And um, 
the the problem with that is that it means that in other that other narratives never get spoken aloud. Yeah, that's very and true. and so this is where it there have to ha- be people with both the experience but also the willingness to talk about the experience. Uh, <laughs> and that if anything, when we talk about outliers. I, I think that so and, and non insiders in the music and, and electronic music fields, I think one of the problems is that especially people who have been in the system for a long time or have been outside the system for a long time have gotten beaten up by it. Beaten <laughs> up to the point that they no longer feel free to talk about it. And I so I think true. it's I think it's great that you're willing to talk about it and to talk about these people. And to bring to our attention uh, the the necessity for them to be spoken of in the history of this work. Yeah, well, that's yeah. It's and in fact, it makes the history it makes the history more complex and it sprawls. Uh, but the net effect of it is, I hope, invites it sort of invites people. So instead of you know, you can think of history as either like a photograph of the negotiations that ended the Vietnam War. It's a big mm-hmm. round table, and there's a whole bunch of old men sitting looking serious around the table. Or you can think of history as um, a wedding reception for two really big, really large, sprawling families who have never <laughs> really met each other before. And in one case, everyone is negotiating quietly over a limited number of things. And in the other case, it's a matter. Person <laughs> sitting to your left is somebody you've never met. Uh, they've had too much to drink, and they're weeping quietly into their plate. Uh, the person to your right is basically trying to corral their kids and throwing elbows back and forth. And uh, there's a couple sitting across the table you've never seen before who appear to be engaged in some kind of passionate embrace. And <laughs> and you're just sitting at the table trying to make sense of it. Right. And your natural inclination is to think, yeah, what am I doing here? Well, and, and, yeah, and, and the, asking the, the what other you're assumption doing. is that is that everybody else here planned to do the thing they're doing. Exactly, and they didn't. <laughs> they didn't. And the really good question about history is is basically a really simple one, and that is like, what am I doing here? Right. Like looking at where you are, looking at 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 who who these two families are, who catered the who catered this <laughs> thing? Like, like how come there's two kinds of ham? Right. 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 What story like does that. that tell? Right. Exactly, and then just saying like, "Well, what am I doing? What am I doing here? Uh, or should I go over and ask? Uh, should I go over and ask that person to dance?" Right. That's the other. That's what. That's what history is, and that's why we love it. Well, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. It was fantastic. And anytime, man. All right, man. Have a great day. Hey, and no promises about what to do next. No, time. not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll squeeze some out of you eventually. Okay. Cool. All right. Thanks, man. So there you have it. Another great conversation with Gregory Taylor. It's really interesting to learn more about Synology, uh, one of the most influential institutions that you may have never heard of. So uh, it was really great to have Gregory share some of that. Um, a couple of uh, news notes here. First of all, I really want to thank uh, Chris Blarsky and Amy Bible for their work. I'm putting together the, the Denver Synth Meet. It was yesterday. It was pretty amazing. Um, saw some amazing bargains get bought and sold there. Um, I think it's one of those things where the first year is going to leave an impression on people for uh, having seen some off- awesome things go down. Um, and especially a chance, a great chance to talk to Jim Lewin, who came out from Iowa to spend a little time at the Synth Meetup. So that was really cool. Secondly, I want to thank all the listeners uh, for keeping the numbers up. It's really been fantastic to kind of watch things move forward. Uh, I'm really pleased with that. And finally, um, I just want to ask you to help me out with one thing. Uh, there's a bit of a movement now afoot to actually get people to get onto iTunes and uh, give us some reviews and some ranking points because. Apparently, I'm missing out on fantastic opportunities to get more listeners by not having a highly rated podcast. 
So if you could just get on there and do that, that'd be great. Uh, certainly Herman Pearl has been kind of banging on me about uh, getting a little more serious about my personal marketing. So there you go. I'm not much into it, but I'm, I'm just going to try and do it for him, right? Well, in any case, I want to thank you very much for listening, and I will talk to you next week. Bye.